Hey YouTube, this is City Prepping. In this video, I have the honor of interviewing Jeff Kirkham here at Ready Man in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, a mutual friend of ours introduced me to him. And uh, it's one of those individuals you didn't know how much information they have until you actually sit down and talk to him. He's a prepper. And I was really, really amazed at the wealth of information that he has. Uh, Jeff is a Special Force Green Beret of 29 years, retired, is that correct? Yep. Okay, yep. awesome. And so we sat down this afternoon, had a lot of good conversations talking about prepping. His website, readyman.com, specializes in prepping. And from my understanding, uh, getting down, uh, sitting down and talking to you today, really what the uh, value that you bring to the prepping community is teaching all the wealth of information that you have and bringing that over to a civilian population and actually learning how to prepare for emergency for grid down situations based off all the things that you've seen traveling around the world, having gone through and seen probably countries where there's a kind of a true SHTF uh, situation. So first of all, thank you for allowing me to come to your yeah, uh, studio. So yeah, uh, we're here obviously recording. That's why we have this professional setup. But what I would love to do in this video is I've got a series of questions I'd love to ask you. Again, just getting you know your information and we're gonna talk a little about his book, by the way. Uh, we'll talk about this at the end of the video, but he's an author of an amazing prepping book that I've got lined up to read here next. And so pretty excited about that. But yeah, I would love to just start off by getting to know a little about you, your background, and uh, you know, we'll kind of segue into prepping here in a second. But yeah, you know, just briefly tell me the kind of the high level view of your background. Yeah, so I, I joined the mill in two thousand, or excuse me, two thousand. Jeez, I wish <laughs> nineteen eighty seven. Okay. is when I joined, and um, and then um, ended up going to special forces school in eighty eight. Right after that, and then um, fast forward, you know, I was on. Um, active duty and then I got out and I went to the guard you know so the National Guard has special forces too which is essentially identical except for the time um, you know the time commitment to active duty special forces and so I'd gotten out um, went to the 19th special forces group and um, was hired as a special agent for the DEA so as a special agent for DEA and and then the war kicked off and um, ended up going back over into on the invasion of Iraq and then um, got recruited into a counter-terrorist unit, came home, left the DEA, went straight back over into the military and special operations, and then spent about 13 years in the counter-terrorist unit, um, rack, uh, somehow managed to rack up just over eight years on the ground between uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, wow. um, working as a... Um, uh, SF guy, where there'd be small contingents of Americans, there'd be about four of us, three, four, five of us, and we'd have 50 to 200 um, uh, local guys that we were lead training and advising. Wow. So we'd recruit, like Afghanistan, we'd recruit these guys out of the mountains, um, running through a training uh, training evolution, and then, you know, it was a couple of months long, and then it was like, okay, get your rifle, we're going to go start hitting targets. And so we would train during the day target packets would come in about you know two o'clock in the afternoon two three o'clock in the afternoon go into the planning cycle grab our guys that were on alert go hit targets at night wake up the next morning and do it all over again so i did that for quite a while so it was a very non-typical um unit with its you know within the you know the usg and so um uh, later on went over and said okay i've you know did that for long enough and body got busted up quite a bit and broke my back and my leg and you know my you know a litany sounds like evil knievel when i go through everything <laughs> and um decided to become a businessman and so you know that's where ready man and some of my other um, companies came from awesome very cool so obviously you've got this background in the military you've seen a lot you've been in places where we would probably classify those areas as a grid down kind of a the way americans would almost view a post-apocalyptic environment where oh, yeah. the country is falling apart so mm -hmm. how uh, how all that ties into prepping obviously that's one of your primary focuses now so why switch from that whole background training people going through everything why switching over to prepping and what's kind of your take and what you bring to the prepper community what were those two well I, I think more more so than any other occupational specialty that's in the military Special Forces or the Green Berets, we actually, that's what we're trained to do. And a lot of guys don't even know that, but that's what we're trained to do. So it's small groups of guys uh, that go into an area and organize and train in resistance. And the thing with 
SF guys, special forces guys, Green Berets, you know, the term is is interchangeable. In the in the United States military, there's only one special forces and we wear Green Berets. Everybody else, like the SEALs, the Rangers and all are special operations. Delta Force, they're yeah. special operations. But there's only one special forces yeah. and that's us. The and and that was the Green Berets. But we're uniquely situated where we'll go into austere conditions and lead, train, and advise um, local forces. And so we're constantly learning or figuring out or studying how to make make do with less. Okay. And so if you're an SF guy, the team is broken down by the cool skills, right? So you've got your officer, you've got your intel sergeant, you've got your weapon sergeant, your communication sergeant, your demolition sergeant, and your, your medical sergeant. Well, all of those guys have auxiliary duties that they do as well. So your and your demolition sergeant also does supply, and your your weapon sergeant also does training, and your medical sergeant runs everybody's medical records and makes sure that everybody's um, is healthy and ready to deploy. And your communication sergeant, you know, is going through and, and running spreadsheets on inventory and everything that's within the team. And so you've got this duplicity of jobs that's going on because when you hit the ground. And it's like all of a sudden you're at your base camp and the sewer's not working. You call the Charlie or the demolitions guy because he is the engineer. And mm -hmm. it's like, hey, and everybody pitches in and learns these jobs because you're used to living in or you get used to living in these austere conditions. Gotcha. And so and nowhere else. And we're trained to do that in SF, whereas no nobody else really gets it. They'll get pieces of it. But it's not a career path for anybody. You know, SEALs are assaulters. Rangers are assaulters. You know, combat controllers in the Air Force and the PJs, combat controllers will get um, will get attached to us from time to time or some of the other units. Mm -hmm. Same with PJs once in a while. But PJs are trauma medics, whereas the long-term care is, is specifically more a special forces medic. Um, so our, our medics are trained to everything from deal with gunshot wounds to pulling teeth wow. and delivering babies oh, wow. and so much much more broad because because we're training to live in those austere conditions so that's really what get i guess in a sense you're already in that frame a frame of mind of you know having to deal with so many conditions and so many situations uh it sounds like you know just having learning how to adapt to so many potential problems so bring that over into prepping um really what got you interested i mean obviously i know your background just as you just explained but when you look at the civilian population individuals like myself when you come and talk mm -hmm. to this group how do you translate all of that where you know when i look at people like yourself and i'm like wow it's so advanced how would i ever get to that level but how could i take everything you learned and kind of downloaded that in a way that i could apply that into prepping so really what i'm trying to figure out is what how are you bringing what are, what are you bringing to the community what do you want to do what do you want to teach you know the the biggest thing if i could sum up ready man in just a short you know just a short phrase or an elevator pitch yeah. is helping you master self-reliance and and we're still learn we're still students ourselves so we're not professing to know everything and all of that and we bring folks in like yourself that i mean it's a sharing of information and knowledge back and forth that helps us improve that we'll then incorporate into our emergency preparedness plan but but it's helping to get people self-reliant and whatever that means that's a very broad brush stroke um answer but you know what is self-reliance is that is that physical is that emotional is that psychological is that financial is that gearing up for the the complete and total collapse or something as simple as mom and dad lose their job yeah and and so where we're coming in we're we're saying hey here's some stuff that we've seen that we'd learn because mom and dad you know if it's a total collapse obviously mom and dad lose their job but the probability is that's going to happen and life's just going to keep on going and the country is is normalcy and so with that we say hey what can we do to help serve other people and that's really why we're here is because we want to we want to help as many folks as possible because one that that's how you prepare and then two we're we're big believers we're constantly beating the drum of build your community build your tribe you know and all of that starts with you know your family your friends your community your neighborhood okay that's around you and 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 i feel that's something that we've we've somewhat lost in modern sure. society as we've become more and more uh you know disjointed and not even so much disjointed is is we live our own lives you know we have these amazing devices yeah. that we can do a plethora of information 
on, but it also allows us to hide from you know, the community building stuff, which I think is a huge detriment. You talk about that a lot. When we talked today, you brought up community, and that's something that I know a lot of times when I listen to the comments section of my videos, I hear so many times the lone wolf attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, people are, as we discussed, so afraid to even share with others that they are quote unquote a prepper. Maybe that's a bad phrase to use when you're talking to your neighbor, yeah. right? But I mean, let me ask you this, and I don't want to, you know, uh, pull you too far off on a tangent on this, but that's a question I get asked a lot. You know, how do you begin to build a community, uh, especially without broadcasting the fact that you're a prepper and that you have supplies? Because that's the fear is people don't want other people to know, mm -hmm. right? So, but it's a double-edged sword because if you don't let people know and you're not helping, you know, train your neighbors, then when something happens, if you're the only one, then that's not going to be good. So, well, how would you, I mean, is that something y'all discuss a lot? How would you even begin to build that community? Absolutely. And and I think you primarily build the community off of, you build relationships of trust. Okay. And relationships of trust are built off of a couple of different things. But it starts with, you know, working and building off of common ground. Okay. So everybody worries about some type of calamity in their life. That's why we have insurance. That's why we have bank accounts and we're not keeping the cash you know, under our mattress. So everybody is there. So it may be just as simple as that's where that that's be kind of the place that you begin. A classic example is Costco. Costco is a great example. It's like you go into Costco and you're buying like way more food than you need, but you're buying it for a cheaper price because you're like, well, I'm going to get a better deal, but I'm getting sure. more food or toilet paper or whatever that is that's going on but in the back of our heads it's like well it's i'm going to use it and it's there if i'm going to need it right well that's that's an emergency preparedness self-reliance prepper survivalist whatever you want to call it that's the beginning of that mindset and if you and if you build off of that common ground you build those relationships of trust it will it will proceed into other things there's nobody that will deny that natural calamities hit the united states every single year sure California, you guys just experienced. We lead the nation in calamities, 350 some odd since 1953. Yeah, in, we're, we're in the worst. California. Yeah, I mean because think about it. You've got, I mean, geez, you guys have got wildfires. Yep. You've got tsunamis. You've got earthquakes. Riots. I mean, you've got yeah, riots. We've got, we've got everything. I mean, it's like <laughs> California should be full of nothing but preppers. But you know, a lot of that is yeah. is people want to deny. You know, it's a little bit of self denial because you, yeah. they want to hide from it. Boy, it's a beautiful environment. We all want to stay happy, yeah. and it's hard to and think about the bad. And it's kind of a bummer to think about the bad right. but the yeah. bad is really bad when you're not prepared it is for it. yeah well i mean we're warned constantly about the big one and when it hits uh, it's gonna be brutal it's gonna be brutal and i think that's why it's so critical to build those relationships because uh you know every every bit of training i've taken you know like cert training i'm sure you've heard of that it always mm -hmm. points back to that you know being ready and having community you so. you can't do it yourself no. you, you can't you can't do it solo that is like if I could stand up on a soapbox and preach and, and what I would say is the the lone wolf is a complete and total myth. There's not one place in history where you can find where that was successful to a large scale. Hmm. Not one place. And, and people will say, well, what about the mountain men? And I'll go, OK, you have the mountain men that would go out for short periods of time. And then they would come back in and they would trade with the Indians and then they would have rendezvous where they were trading with the other mountain men. Hmm. And all of those mountain men would come together in groups so that they could go after other rogue mountain men, bandits or rogue Indians okay. that were causing them problems. They always came back together. They'd go out for short periods of time and they come back even so much so that many of the mountain men that were out there. I mean, that's the easiest one to think about when mm -hmm. you say hermit, you know, or lone, gotcha. you know, lone wolf. Right. It, Many of them married Indian wives huh. because and, and got and basically got adopted or ingratiated into the surrounding tribes. As human beings, we have to be surrounded by other human beings right. or, or there's a downward spiral and we are not we won't survive because we start losing what I call the three pillars of preparedness, which is the physical, psychological and emotional. And it's and it's a. It's a stool that stands there, and if you remove one leg on the stool, yep. then then that stool is going to topple over because you're out of balance. Sure. Wow. Yeah, we talked about that earlier today. Uh, you know, you brought those elements up and just how critical it is to be that well-rounded, you know, prepper to have all three of those covered. Uh, one of the things that we also discussed that I thought was so fascinating, and again, the name of my channel is Sydney Prepping, and I asked you the question, you know, uh, I, I don't think I asked you the question, but we were talking about a lot of people have the mindset that if anything happens, 
we're going to run for the country. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to go out to the boonies and survive on our own out there. Um, I thought you brought up some really interesting points based, again, off your experience, what you've seen traveling around the world, uh, having seen areas that have been in prolonged what we would consider grid down situations where, you know, things have fallen apart. There's uh, whatever civil war just collapse. Can you talk a little more about that, about the concept of, you know, I guess in a sense, I'm asking you urban living, suburban, whatever you want to call it, versus just going off in the country and trying to make it. Yeah. So historically speaking, we did a bunch of research into this because it's like, what's best, right? Should you be out in the boondocks with your family or should should you be in the city or should you be in something in between? And historically speaking, one of the guys that we had spoken to was Fairfowl, who wrote the book, The uh, Coming Economic Collapse. And he was talking about Argentina. And as we've seen repeatedly and so our best guess because it's all a guess at this point until it actually happens but our best guess is the people who live in suburbia actually fare the best now as everybody does the eye roll and you know the gasp it's like (laughs) they're all going to the comment section right they're all going to the comment section all right everybody slow down but folks (laughs) in the city obviously have a hard time but the cities don't go away think caracas right now the cities are full of people Mm. and there's plenty that would be like well that was me i was gonna leave well there's a reason those people are staying in the cities yes it's hard living in the cities but it's probably not as bad as some would think and then and then you've got suburbia well let's skip over to the people that live in the boondocks you know if you think about the people in the boondocks let's let's take bosnia for example the serbs surrounded um the serbs surrounded the city and sat there and shelled it because they didn't want to go into the city because they knew they'd get chewed up but everybody that was in farms outside of the city got run over by tanks from the Serbs because there was no way to do any type of mutual support. And we saw the same thing. We saw the same thing. We saw it in Bosnia. We saw it in Rhodesia. Hmm. We saw it in, we're seeing it in South Africa right now. Um, They saw it in Argentina. So the people that were, again, it's, it's a little bit of that lone wolf, not so much because you'd have these ranches that were out there, but even those, those people were, you know, Uh, horrific crimes were committed against them because there was no way to defend themselves against roving bands of bandits and so as and typically as we look at least throughout history the suburbia there's enough people there you know suburbia whatever that is in wherever you're at in the world but there's enough people there that you have mutual support for defense as far as in work and also, you know, psych, the physical, psychological and emotional support that we need to continue surviving as well as thriving. Yeah. Because surviving is a downward spiral. You, you can't survive. You've got to be getting a little bit better every single day or else you're getting a little bit worse. There is no maintenance that's taking place there. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. Okay. And so, and the and the folks that were in suburbia seem to have the best out of both that we've seen in the historical context, between the best between the city as well as okay. the people that were out in the country. So the guy that's in downtown New York uh, versus the guy that's out, you know, wherever, out in the deep woods or whatever. I mean, there's got to be a balance in between. I, I can mm-hmm. imagine both situations on those extremes. And it was interesting, it like in Afghanistan when I was there. The further remote that you got, so in Afghanistan, we used to do these assaults on compounds. Well, a compound was a fancy way of saying somebody's living structure that was there. Yeah. And in the cities, all of these compounds have walls around them. They're 10 to 14 foot you right. know, high walls that surround everything. And, and the further you got out of town, the higher the walls got and the more families lived inside the walls. Huh. Until finally, you, if you got way out there in the boondocks like Mangrete or Lawar or something. Okay. A lot of these places look like castles that were made out, you know, they were mud brick and whatnot, right. but they had, they had watchtowers on each corner. Oh, wow. These walls went, there were no 10 foot high walls when there was there. Now there were 15 to 20 foot walls that were five feet thick. You know, they were castles right. because they were getting further out there for mutual defense. Okay. I noticed that same thing. Did I tell you I was in Afghanistan? Right? Yes. Okay, um, no, three. So, yeah, in the yeah. city, I lived in Kabul itself and uh, an area called Kartase. It's, I think, say it was like third. I forget all the whatever. But, yeah, I mean, we had the walls, you know, and we'd have a, a choky door that would stay inside at night and watch and make sure no one's coming in. But we did venture outside the town a few times, and I noticed that. The further out you go, the bigger the compounds got, and it was a, the few times that they allowed us in to see it, it was, you know, a lot of family. And, they, you know, it was that support mindset. You're not going to do it on your own out there. Um, so 
Yeah, that, that's something that comes up a lot whenever I talk about this issue with prepping, staying in the city, doing it by yourself. So uh, I'm very thankful that you were able to bring that view and that expertise from someone that's not just, you know, an armchair quarterback, but somebody that's lived it, seen it, and had to deal with that, you know, watching how other countries have had to deal with this situation. So uh, thanks for speaking to that, because yeah, that's, that's something I hear debated all the time in the comment section. I think I'm going to be pinning and bookmarking this point in the conversation. Go watch this video. Listen to Historically you. speaking, there, there's, I, I, I mean, if there's, if there's a, if there's a broad spectrum, obviously there's onesies and twosies that have worked for sure. people, but overall, you, you can't show any consistent historical record that shows where the lone wolf, surf, you know, thrives. Yeah. You just, you, you, you can't show it. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know of one. I don't either. Yeah. Um, no, it's a valid point. I mean, we're social beings. We enjoy the uh, comfort of others. And like you talked about that three legged, you know, stool, one mm -hmm. of those aspects is psychological and the emotional and, you know, kind of one of the things we talked about today is the value of someone that is even like a spiritual leader within the community, what they bring um, to encourage people, to give them hope. So there's a lot, uh, you know, that we often downplay on the emotional side, focusing on the gear, the gadgets, you know, having firearms, thinking that's what's going to get us through. I think you'll get us through, through a period of time, but if you're going to go the distance, you've got to have that support. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, at some point you're going to get sick, right? You're sure. going to get a cold. You're going to get the flu. You're just going to get the funk. I mean, as human beings, we do this with our emotions, right? And, yeah. and we're constantly balancing stuff out. Depression is, is, a, is a fantastic, you know, if you look at the evolution of man, depression is a fantastic counterbalance to constant adrenaline. Hmm. You need something to ratchet that cortisol back so that it doesn't kill us. That's so what ratchets it back, and then we dip a little bit, and then we come back out of it, and, mm. and we hit this homeostasis. You know, everybody screams about, de you know, depression is a bad thing, and it is a bad thing. But there's a reason we have depressed states in our psyche. It's, it's to help to balance us out. It's when we get out of balance that that really becomes a problem. And the number one way of getting out of the depressed state is we can vet or we can vent with somebody else. You know, pastor, priest, confessor, like what you were talking about, we wrote a blog article about that was a pastor is going to be worth his weight in gold in the apocalypse. And, you know, we got a lot of people in Ready Man, we don't talk about religion or politics specifically, but we'll talk about politics in general sure. or religion in general. Right. And, and you know, and, and we had just discussed this as well as in the Middle Ages and the medieval ages, medieval times, the Catholic Church had to come out and essentially make suicide illegal. And it was such, and they were so worried about it that they came out and they said, hey, you guys, you've got to stop committing suicide because if you do commit suicide, you're going straight to hell. Mm -hmm. And so in an attempt to get people to stop, now think about that. Depression's not some new human emotion right. that we're experiencing in 2019. It's been around forever and so has suicide has been around. Even to the extent that the church had to come out and say, stop doing it. Mm -hmm. You've got to stop doing this. And so in the post-apocalyptic world, whether, whether that's the post-apocalyptic world because your financial means de was destroyed because of like the 2008 crash right. or the true post-apocalyptic world that everything falls apart, having that means of that emotional support is vitally important. Vital, I would, I would say, is essential. Yeah, hope is so critical. It's what will drive people. And without it, what's the point of living? Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and really, that's where people get to is they're like, what's the point? In right. Living? Right. Wow. Well, uh, quite a lot is packed into this conversation. And uh, again, I appreciate you bring so much of your knowledge. And, you know, again, I love getting people's views from so many different expertise backgrounds because, um, you know, again, uh, you know, 30, uh, 29 years in special forces, that's you've seen a lot. <laughs> you know? And uh, again, I appreciate everything that you're bringing to the community. One thing I would like to talk to about before we uh, finish up is your book, Black Autumn. I'll probably try to see if I can get this up on this camera right here. Um, I'll post a link in the description section below, but this is a book that's next on my reading list. So could you give me, you know, your quick elevator pitch? Give me a couple of minutes to talk about that. Yeah. So um, Jason and I were sitting around. Jason was he was never in the military. He's never, never a police officer. He's an extraordinarily accomplished outdoorsman, however, and um, has taught me a ton of stuff about that. And um yeah, and he's one of the co-owners of Ready Man. And so we were sitting around the table one time talking about, you know, 
how we thought the world could stumble or how there could be a problem. You know, and I was like, well, I'll, I'll give you my opinion. This is how I think it could happen. And and then it turned into a, well, if that happened here, and it, it was all centered around Utah. And, um, and it's like, well, if that happened, then what do you think would happen? And then what do you think would happen? And then how would we deal with that? And how do you think that would happen? And so it turned into kind of this ongoing, you know, you watch the movies where they're playing chess and it's yeah. the same chess game for, you know, over weeks and weeks and weeks. Well, this became a ongoing topic of discussion for weeks and yeah. weeks and weeks of how we would deal with this stuff. And at one point, I think it was Jason was like, man, we should we should write this down. Write this this would be a pretty interesting <laughs> book. And, and I was like, all right, yeah, let's do it. And so... Um, so we did we started writing it down and so black autumn is how we think the world could stumble not specifically but the mechanism of how we think the world could stumble and then also how we would react to it here in utah and the book takes place here in utah and it's a and it's a war gaming exercise that we went through and then we just captured all of it on paper and added some drama and some characters and whatnot but it's our best guess you know, based off of historical research as well as, you know, current research of, of how what we think would happen. So I know I just kind of taking a quick look at the inside or the outside, of, or was it the, yeah, the kind of the introduction to the book, excuse me, was it that a nuclear warhead is brought to the port of L.A.? Mm-hmm. Why do you guys hate California so much? Everybody <laughs> thinks we're going down. I always tell my wife I'd be surprised if I live my life without seeing L.A. at least go up at one time or another. So I'm there with you. You know, it's we're well, all kind of weak. You know, and, and I, I mean, this is going to be a spoiler alert. So, I mean, but it, it's in the first few chapters of the book. The nuke doesn't really kill anybody. Huh. Just a psychological impact, I would imagine. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. But it incites panic that all of a sudden has a huge trickle-down trickle down. effect Absolutely. of other instances that are already happening. Well, that's the, the nature world. of terrorism. You just have that spark. It's the terror, right? It seizes people and anything can go from there. Yeah. So, wow. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to reading this. And again, I'll post a link in the description section below and I'll pin that if you want to check that out. And this is on Amazon, correct? It's on Amazon. Okay, yep. very cool. Yep. You can get us on Amazon and we may be still at Barnes and Noble and okay. some other place, but Amazon is the primary place sure. to go. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you letting me come to your offices and getting to know uh, a little about your background, your history, and what you bring to the prepper community. And again, I encourage people to go check out readyman.com. Uh, I was reviewing some of the material on there before I came in to the, uh, sit down and talk to you today. And there's a lot of information I'm gonna be extracting off pretty soon because there's things that you, I know, talk about specifically um, you know, when it comes to uh, understanding how, I wouldn't hate, I hate to use the word combat situations, but learning how to deal with not just firefights, but actually learning how to maneuver and other things that, mm-hmm. I mean, I can go to a range, I can shoot all day long, but these kind of things, I would get outflanked very quickly. And I'd love to begin to learn to study these different things. So again, I think it's a great resource. If you want to learn more, go check out his website. And again, thanks so much uh, for allowing me to be here. Yeah, so. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, if you enjoyed the video, click on the like button, share on social media, and as always, be safe out there.